Hello, everyone, and a happy Thursday. I'm Silver Shells. I'm Cindy Jenkins. And we are the, the Bling, Bling Sisters. Sisters. And welcome to our show, Silver Shells Bling Party. And as you can see, ooh, we are uptown today. We have new equipment. We do. We have headphones and a little Well, we mixing. had headphones before, but we're implementing some sound equipment that's helping us with the audio quality yes. of the show sound equipment so, so hopefully everybody can hear us okay and if you have any comments go ahead and make them in our comment box cindy and i are two women from sonoma county and we started with an online jewelry show uh, back last year in november we're up to our anniversary our year anniversary we are and we, we passed it we did Okay. It was November 14th. We didn't celebrate. Anyway, so December 1st, we started, decided to start Yay. interviewing people. And so far, we have interviewed 92 people on our show since December 1st. And today, we have number 93. So, uh, Cindy and I enjoy it. We interview actors, musicians. musicians. Oh, my gosh. Different genres. Developers, record producers, promoters. Uh, radio hosts. So we're we're kind of interviewing a triple threat today. He's a producer, uh, musician, and bass player. So I think we should bring him in. What do you think? Number and oh, we ha don't we have a spotlight? Oh, don't you want to talk about that? We have the local spotlight today. Something new. It's new. We're going to be uh, featuring a local musician every week for two minutes in the middle of the show. So stay tuned. It's going to be fun. And we might have, we have some people in the wings that we're bringing onto our show, but we do have upcoming besides Fabrizio Grossi. Grossi? Grossi. Grossi. Oh my gosh, let me trip over my tongue. And uh, so we have Bird Lake Pittman coming up. Yes, we do. Rudy Columbini. Rudy. Ms. D. Logwood. She's great. Troy Redfern. And I gotta, I'm just going to put it out there right now. We are looking to get Elmo Shropshire on our show on December 23rd. So we're trying. We are, we are doing. We're making an effort. So if anybody knows Elmo, <laughs> tell him that the Bling Sisters are looking for him. We'll find him no matter where he is. Okay. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so we, we, uh, we're bringing on guest number 93, Fabrizio Grossi, and we're going to call him Fab. Can we call you Fab? Absolutely. That's what everybody's calling me. So. I love it. Absolutely. So you were born, uh, so you're a, a producer and a bassist, and oh my gosh, you are, have been in so many bands, I can't believe it. <laughs> so, well, you know. 
just trying to keep busy, you know. It's the life of a musician. Yeah, yeah. exciting, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so right now you're living in L.A. Yeah. Well, actually, I've been living here for like twenty five. Uh, yeah, well, twenty five years, pretty much. Twenty five, okay. twenty four, twenty five. So, and, and before that, that, but you lived in New York, right? Yeah, that was my, I mean, I did the actual, uh, I guess, the, the Italian immigrant route from Italy to New York. <laughs> and then it was either Long Island or Florida, and I picked California. <laughs> <laughs> California I don't, California was a good choice. It was an excellent choice. I'm glad you're here. I so, didn't regret it. <laughs> Never. So, everyone, uh, so you were born in Milan, and yep. you... Were you, what kind of music did you listen to when you were a kid? Did you listen to pop, rock? Um, well, you know, Italy back then is obviously it's not what it is now. Um, the funny thing is, uh, even though like my, I would say, junior high years were like more rock dominated, including the first, uh, the early years of uh, high school as well, um, it didn't start off like that. And when I was a kid, you know, we, we hear the music on the radio, uh, but radio obviously would not play rock music, impossible. However, they played a lot of soul, uh, funk, and you know, Blues. R&B. For me, much more and more like I would say, for like from James Brown to Heart Wind and Fire, and you know, that kind of stuff. You know, it, it's just it's Tina Turner. I mean, it was like really strange because actually that's the music that I like the most. Right. Um, I never really understood why, you know, there was like that very section. But actually, that was really good because, you know, uh, together with Italian music, um, I would hear these things coming in and out. And then, you know, obviously, I got more into, you know, uh, I would say intensively. I remember that when I was four, and I know that this is like, how can you remember that? Well, big thing. On a Saturday night, uh, they had this TV show, that go on, these TV shows, they go on for like two or three hours with guests and everything. I remember it was showing black and white. Uh, I found out later, you know, everybody in the band and all of it. But James Brown did his first live performance in Italy on the Italian TV. And he was just insane. I remember that. And that's something that really hit me uh, incredibly. And, uh, and right after him, it was Bob Marley. Bob Marley. Uh, and I got, you know, incredibly attached by Bob Marley. And actually, the first, I would say, guitar driven musician that. Uh, I got to kind of like, you know, like as a guitar player, but not as a band, because obviously the Beatles and Rolling Stones around the house, you know, you will be definitely getting their fair share of playing. But in terms of like a guitar, somebody that's known for the instrument, that was Carlos Santana. And it's funny enough, because all these names that I've just mentioned, you yeah. know, they keep coming back and they're still with me right now. And, you know, regardless of everything that happened throughout the years, uh, it's still some sort of my main influence. Your, your main uh, it, you met, did, have you met, like, did you meet Freddie Mercury? Did did they go in, were they there in Italy? Did they tour there? Actually, it's funny that you're mentioning that because uh, when I was, uh, uh, I was about to turn 16 and I just started playing, uh, in Italy was common during those years, like uh, uh, mid 80s, uh, to send your kids to England for a couple of weeks, to stay okay. with the family so they could practice English and all that kind of stuff. Well, that summer I went there. And um, I ended up in going to this show with Castle Donington. It's like a monster of rock, like 120,000 people. And a lot of friends of mine from Milan were there as well. So we saw a bunch of different bands. Funny enough, a lot of musicians that premiered that night ended up in being people that I ended up in working with or, you know, became friends. So it's just kind of like a strange cycle. Yeah. And I remember Whitesnake, the first incarnation of Whitesnake, the we more had- Blues, uh, not the stuff, not the, the hair band that everybody knows here in the states. Uh, headlined that show and they played a cover of Bobby Blue Bland, Bobby uh, in Blue. Love in the Heart of the City. And that thing, the way they turned the whole thing around with that song, it just really touched me. Four year, four months later, Queen played the only show that they've ever played uh, with the original lineup uh, in in Italy. They played in Milan, and I was there probably like five row from the stage, and I still have goosebumps. I mean. That was my closest encounter with Freddie Mercury, but it was just, I still, I still see it. So was it, did the reaction of the audience have an influence on you at all? Uh, you, yeah, that's, uh, um, when you perform live, it's, um, it's something else. It doesn't matter if it's 
100,000 people or five people. It's just that's the fact that you're there with other people, other friends, and you're communicating, and you just bring it out, and you can easily detect the actual mood of the people and the reaction. That's something that I think people don't necessarily uh, realize, that when they see music or when they hear music, I, their old body language, their faces, the eyes change. And being sometimes on stage and having sometimes lights there, I can see the faces of people. And you can see the way you are kind of like affecting. Right. And, and that's, like I said, that's incredible. And also, I guess sometimes when you're up there and, uh, you know, and you have like, like sometimes like these big festivals that we play with Supersonic Blues Machine, sometimes you have like eight or 10, 15,000 people. And I remember this fir- the second show that we did, thanks to the guest that we had in the band that night, we were headlining one of the biggest blues festivals in Europe. And that was this, our second show. Uh, into song number two, people were singing along. And it's just like, how the hell did you know the song? I mean, the lyrics of the song. And actually hearing people singing your lyrics. I mean, I'm, I'm actually the main writer in the band, uh, but I definitely take care of uh, most of the lyric content. And so it kind of like hits me particularly. So it's just an overall otherworldly experience. You know, it's a, you cannot quantify it, but it's a, it's a serious drug. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Yeah, having people sing your songs. So you, you, uh, when did you decide to actually move to New York or move to America? How old were you? Uh, 21, 20 or 21. I mean, the idea was already there because uh, in my late teens, uh, we were signed with with Sony in Italy, and uh, the label sent us a few times uh, between New York and uh, and Canada. I mean that part of upstate New York and uh-huh. Ontario to play. There was a lot of there was a great live scene back then, and so we could practice and just hang, you know practice English and hang with you know American or you know English speaking musicians and all that. So I mean I was already getting in, in and out, and uh, the thing is like I. So the way that people run, were running the sa- sounds and, you know, they were dealing with music was more like closer to what I thought it should have been. Okay. Instead of like wh- how people were dealing, at least with our kind of music in Italy. So there was always an interest. And I mean, I was doing quite well. Uh, even though I was very young, I was playing with a bunch of different Italian artists that were doing like uh, shows on the weekend. So it actually was pretty good. But, you know, it wasn't really the kind of stuff that I... I enjoyed. wanted to do it since my band broke up, as usual, like, you know, and <laughs> I said, you know what, I either do it now, or, I mean, I don't know, when am I going to wait later? So that, that's, that's pretty much what did it. All right, so you decided, and then when you moved to, uh, you moved to New York in 1999, you met someone, what in the world, I dropped my notes, so anyway, uh, what was it? Be Happy. Nina Hagen? Oh, no, that actually was in Los Angeles. That, that was I, in Los Angeles, I, okay. I started to work. See, actually, that was the first big collaboration that I got uh, in L.A. Uh, after moving here from New York. Okay. New York, actually, is very responsible for a lot of things about me, about, you know, where I ended up in turning musically, uh, to kind of like uh, getting to a little bit more like the music community here in the States and get to meet a lot of great people and, um, you know, just kind of like, I guess, fine tune a little bit everything uh, that was about me with music because nowadays, everywhere you go, maybe the language changes a bit, I mean, changes a bit, changes, but everything else is pretty much the same. Back then, I mean, it was also a very, I don't know, just like, it's not that, it wasn't that common, you know, so I had to readjust a lot of things, but it was a great school and great people. And, you know, then when I came to Los Angeles, I kind of like actually I went more for the public. In New York, I had a, a, a great band. We played around the old tri-state area. Uh, we had a great time and all of it. But I guess that was not meant to be what we thought that it was going to be. And I think, you know, after their breakup, it was okay. Let's try another move now. So you're self-taught, correct? You, you didn't mm-hmm. take music lessons. You just so, you just decided you were going to be a musician no, uh, yeah but no because uh, not by choice uh, uh i kind of like actually went to went through a trauma because okay. uh when i was uh 16 
15, 16, and then I decided that I wanted to learn how to play bass. Um, well, obviously, coming from in Italy, a European, the whole thing, it's just classical music. So I did an attitude test at the conservatory for upright, and just, I got, you know, I got picked up and everything. So I, I wanted to do it that way, just learning how to... But I ended up with a teacher that was, I don't know how much cursing is allowed on your show. A I don't think, I think little no, little kid, no children just, are watching. Uh, I would go like from beep, 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 <laughs> and keep going. And it was just like a very ungracious experience. Uh, and uh, to be honest with you, that kind of like got me to scorn the whole education system uh. and everything. It's just like, you know what? It, if this is what I have to go through to, to play, this is not new. This is not even teaching, you know? And uh, that's pretty, and at, at, at the point that I realized that I needed to study and all of that is like when actually I was already playing with my band and then I came out here and there was no more time to do that because I was already supporting myself being a musician. So yeah. I either do one or the other. But that's why uh, throughout the years, I've always been very uh, involved with music, ed music education. Not myself, obviously, but I, I, of course, I right. do classes for music productions and music business and all of that, sure. But in terms of like... Uh, uh, bass or something like that too. Somebody wants to see what do I do when I play, fine. But um, I'm saying I've been always very attached to music, um, music education in school. I've partnered up with uh, uh, several different international departments of Berkeley, uh, oh. one specific in Mexico, and uh, to create like an atmosphere. And I was able to bring some of the biggest musicians, you know, that we have here in the States, you know, from from you know Chick Corea band from Steve Vai to Eric Marienthal, Jack White and all these people going down there and sharing their time their, oh, you how know fun. it's the thing is you know for me like I said it's very important to have people when you have a teacher that inspires you yes. and you know and moves you when you don't you don't need you know Joe Jackson like you know dance and you know, like, or shut up or practice and if you, I mean, you might be a great musician yourself, but then doesn't necessarily make you a great teacher. Right. And uh, and um, having or, lived myself on the my on the my on my own skin, uh, what it means dealing with bad teacher and a bad concept around education. Always trying to kind of kind of like give myself a goal that wherever was possible uh, for me to collaborate uh, and you know in, in an environment that will help students. To achieve their maximum, you know, and really learn something instead of being put down or uh, forced to learn one way. Abuse, it, yeah. yeah. So we are going to watch a video, and it is Cindy's going to introduce it. It is Soul Let's Garage see. Experience right down below. It's the official video. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that before we roll? Sure, on? quickly. Well, yeah, Soul yeah. Garage Experience is my solo band. Um, I call it like that because I really value the guys that are playing with me, even though it's a rotational musicians, so I needed to give them a credit. So it's, <laughs> I think it's not, it, and also I think it's a pretty cool name. It um, is. Like I said, it's my side project. It's something that I wanted to do for forever and never really had the opportunity for one thing or another. This is like where I kind of like get to develop my really the more, you know, the, my black music lover side. Uh, I mean, Supersonic Blues Machine, of course, it's blues-based music, but... Uh, on our second record, I was uh, tending to go a little bit more too funky, too soul and everything. And that was more me than the rest of the band. So I decided that that was not good for me. It was actually not even wise to impose that to the other guys. I decided to take it on me and got a bunch of mus great musicians, Stephen Perkins uh, from James Addictions and Derek Day, Diamond Mix and uh, uh, Alistair Green and a, a, a great slate of other musicians are recording with me. Uh, the first the four that I mentioned are part of the live band. And uh, this is a socially uh, themed record. Um, all my lyrics with Supersonic are always very uh, love, understanding, peace, unity, and all that kind of stuff, very hippie. But uh, uh, on Soul Garage Experience, uh, there is also not my political side, because it's not political, but it's kind of like the harder side on the social uh, you know, on the social aspect. In other words, I like to, when people ask, this about how social you're getting in the record. Well, I would say, do you do you know what Tom Morello does? Uh, yes, okay. Well, just cook, think of me as uh, one of his cousins, you know? Okay. <laughs> uh, and that's why the video right down below talks about uh, the uh, a lot of thematics like uh, um, uh, income inequality and disparity and, you know, homelessness. Uh, 
the homeless situation that we have in Los Angeles and around the world, it is insane. Um, I wanted to direct and also film and edit the video because I just wanted to make sure that the images were given a real impact because it's easy for us to discuss about like uh, uh, discrimination, racism, uh, uh, income inequality, uh, gender inequality, and all of that. But when we talk, to show a video, I needed stronger images. And I think uh, using the situation of the homeless, it's kind of like it gets people to understand, well, hold on one second, this is something yeah. not right. That's Los Angeles, what happened? So that's, okay. that's what the whole story right. is about. Let's Excellent. roll it. Are we'll we be ready? back. I'm ready. Roll it, rolling, rolling. Mm -hmm. No one tries. 
And we are back. I'm Silver Shells. I'm Cindy Jenkins. And we are the, the Bling, Bling Sisters. Sisters. And you're watching our show, Silver Shells Bling Party. And we are interviewing people from all over the world, musicians, artists. And we have a new exciting Feature. segment for our show. We are featuring a local spotlight, a... a a uh, musician from our community of Sonoma County or the Bay Area and giving them two minutes to promote themselves uh, or whatever they want. So, so this gentleman is Josh. This is Josh Marin. Josh. And we're going to go ahead and run that now. And we will be back with guest number 93, Fabrizio Grossi. All right, here we go. Here we go. Hi, fellow supporters of the Blink Sisters. My name is Josh Benson Marin, and I'm a pianist and piano teacher in Santa Rosa, California. I've been playing the piano for more than 20 years, and I have performed and accompanied for churches, musical theater, and private events in the Bay Area. And I'm offering piano lessons to students of all ages here in Santa Rosa and around the world. You can now take online piano lessons through Zoom. So if you or your child has always wanted to learn the piano, or you took lessons in the past and you've been wanting to get back into it, Give me a call. My number is 415-342-5161. You can email me at jbensonmarin at gmail.com, or you can check out my website, joshbensonmarin.com. I hope to hear from you, and thank you to the Blink Sisters for featuring me on your show, and continue to watch Blink Sisters live. We are back. That was our spotlight on local. Josh Marin. On Josh Marin. So if you'd like to take piano lessons, just go ahead and call the number that was on the screen. That's right. That's right. Josh seems like a very nice person and, uh, and quite a wonderful classical player. Wonderful. He's wonderful. So we are back with our 93rd guest. And I'm Silver Shells. I'm Cindy Jenkins. We're the, the Bling, Bling Sisters. Sisters. And we're going to say hi to some people right now. So I've got, I want to say hi to Nafamara. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Awa. Uh, oh, Crowbar, I love you, baby. Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Gary. Jeff Butler. We're waving to Gary. Sherry. Sherry. Gary, Gary. Chateau. Greg. Timothy Pyle. Greg Wilson. Rune Air. Rooney Airfield. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Les Where Edwards. John Davidson. John Davidson. We're saying hi to everybody. Okay. Hi, well, Zach, hi, everybody. Kevin, Sabrina. I love you guys. My okay. little family. Let's talk to Fab now. All right. So it'll be what it is, but it better be funky with soul, a bit of blues, and got a rock hard. Is that your motto? Yep. Yep. Except, <laughs> at least the music that I like, you know. <laughs> so you, you, uh, it seems like. So when you went to L, uh, you went to New York, and then you, you why, what made you decide to go? It was the lesser of three evils, or the more fun oh, of the three places. That, that, like, again, my band in New York uh, uh, broke up. We're still very good friends with everybody, but you know, for for a bunch of different reasons. And I guess you know, my previous band broke up, and I moved to New York just as well. <laughs> I, that implies another move, well, not necessarily. It's just that maybe a couple of years before that, started we started to come out to Los Angeles 
at the end of January to attend the NAM show, which is a music conference, you know, with all we brands. We NAM, yeah. NAM, yeah, yeah. We've and, had some. Uh, you know, I kind of like it, uh, a good feeling. And I say, you know what? You know, again, what, what do I got to lose? So, right. You know, that's it. That was very, you know, not too much thinking. That's, so you packed up and you moved to L.A. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What was uh, what was the difference between like L.A. and New York at that time? Was uh, different jams, different whole styles? Well, you know, you know what the thing is. Uh, obviously, the weather, the architecture, the landscape—that's everybody knows that. When it comes down to my profession and being a musician that wanted to be either in band or performing or just kind of like do something that was that would inqu- that would require me to be somehow myself. Um, it was very important to start to networking with people. One thing that Los Angeles has always been great, well, at least back then, and people told me that in the 80s it was even better, uh, it was just like maybe you go to a club and the, the band that plays after you, I mean, it's like, I don't know, um, it's like somebody else that is a friend of uh, another big band and, and all of a sudden among the crowd you got, I don't know, the guys from Motley Crue or you have uh, uh, the singer for Coldplay or you got some. And, Metallica. You know, it's like, it was very, uh, you know. Organic. Careers, you know, it's like you started to talk to musicians, even if they were famous. I would say that I was 99%, 98% of musicians that I met, even established one, always been very, very, very cool people. Never, never had a problem of egos and stuff like that. I mean, again, it's not that they work with all of them. So right, obviously when right. you start to work with people, then you start to know other things. But at, at the personal level and dealing with, you know, uh, with people that were not necessarily the family or circle of friends, always been very, very gracious. And that's actually, it was great. While in New York, if you wanted to meet somebody, uh, you might end up in meeting a friend whose ex-girlfriend had a roommate that they used to date the cousin of the drummer in ACDC. Right. right. You know, so that was the difference. I mean. I'm exaggerating, but right, right. I but. just wanted to, sh- you know, it was a different thing in New York. Everybody, nobody's got time for nothing, and <laughs> it's just everything. It's just needs to happen, and it's always and it's just like really, really, really crazy. Always twenty four seven on, and it's not really a, just a place to hang. I mean, again, you can meet people. Don't get me wrong. Also, the, the this type of um, uh, approach as far as a musician back then for me was still somehow my rock years and even though I always had my passion for you know R&B soul and all that kind of stuff those were the years where probably more rock music was playing and um, in New York back then you could find incredible drummers incredible keyboard players and probably some good bass players uh, but majority was like jazz oriented and even the stuff that was more like the bluesy R&B still had like uh, the the jazz element, which is okay. not really the type of blues that I'm into, or soul. I'm going more like for the neo soul, people, you know, yeah. uh, Robert Johnson and you know Hubert Sumlin, you know Muddy Waters, nice, Olive okay. Walker, and, and all that kind of stuff. While you know, uh, Los Angeles has always been the, the inst- most famous instruments, I guess, was the guitar, and all the big guitar players were living here back then. So the overall scene, the overall approach to it it was just way more like uh you know dynamic uh, open more sun you know more sun so you've been in a lot of bands you've been let's see let's see if i can find some of those some of those names well uh, that's you know, funny yes and no because i mean i recorded with a lot of bands and stuff but being actually member member of a band not really that many. Okay. Uh, I think kind of, th- you know what? It's just because since my band broke up in Italy and then obviously I joined the band in New York, those were band band. I kind of like uh, uh, had an idea that, you know, I love to play with other people, but I also like to be somehow independent in a way that if I need to move forward, I want to move forward. Because generally when you have a band, it's like you marry four people or five people. And it's already difficult sometimes to get along just with one person. So think about five, and and if you start playing together and traveling together and everything, it just becomes. It. So I said, you know what? Let's not get this in too much into this thing with the the band, because that the overall thing, like uh, kids, they're getting together from high school and then they form the band and they become successful. Yeah, that's uh, maybe like one out of a hundred. It doesn't really happen like that. A lot of time is actually all business behind it. 
Yeah. So, you know, sure, I played, I mean, again, Soul Garage Experience, my solo band, obviously Super Sonic Blues Machine, my main band. Uh, I've been in another band with a, several dear friends of mine called Starbreaker. Starbreaker. And, and then was my band in New York, uh, Conspiracy of Silence. But other than that, you know, not really that many. But I believe that the first one, Conspiracy, you probably don't even know. Starbreaker, you probably could still find some stuff out there. So tell us a little bit about Supersonic Blues Machine. Supersonic. It sounds <laughs> well, quick. The name actually it should be, I guess, uh, an introduction for what it is. Meaning uh, it's a blues inspired uh, music, rock music, but we tend to take it to, you know, space. We're not really blues men. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I know very, maybe like two or three guys that can, can call blues men, you know. And they're friends of mine, and we work together often, but these are people that have a blues legacy, and also a uh, legacy as a person and family in the history. The majority are African-American, and they have a reason to claim that. Right. You know, I mean, I really don't know how, you know, how seriously uh, I can write a song about, you know, uh, the pain of, uh, you know, the, my, my cupboard is empty or whatever it is. I, I wasn't born like, uh, you know, Pine Top Perkins or Uber Summer. Right. Uh, in a plantation in Mississippi. I mean, I'm not saying that you need to go through that uh, to be a bluesman. There's, there's a, some great ones come up, came after that and they didn't live personally that story. But that was part of their people. Right. They carry it to it. And uh, I, what we do is obviously I, same thing with Soul Garage Experience, which actually probably has more blues element than Supersonic. Um, we play like a very, very respectful tribute to blues music. Um, yeah. Because it, it's just, you know, it, I guess you have to give Caesar what Caesar's, you know. Right. And in regards of Supersonic, uh, uh, it was not actually supposed to be a band. And it actually almost like happened by no mistake, but it just happened. I was recording a song with Billy F. Gibbons from ZZ Top. Uh, he needed to uh, prepare a new song for a commercial that ZZ Top was going to be doing for a, a Texas whiskey. How cliche, right? And... Um, well, at the end of the day, the song didn't make it because the, the, the director was able to clear another song that he was after. But the rec he's Billy's record company and manager said, you know what, you guys worked on it. You know, you guys use the song, Scott Free, you know, oh. no problem. Not going to even create a problem for Billy's presence or anything like that. So I, I asked Billy, hey, but, uh, we should do something because I think uh, this is pretty cool. It's got a very, there's a particular flair. And he's like, well, you got one song write nine more and start a band and <laughs> right. you know and when i when i'm not busy with my day job i'll come and join you guys i'm like hmm. so i okay. call immediately our drummer probably most famous i guess uh drummer rock drummer in the world uh, sir kenny i don't know that he played with everybody and kenny and i were looking to start something that was very jammy because we actually met through uh, toto's guitar player and founding member steve look at it with his uh, jam solo band. And we wanted to continue that kind of uh, uh, approach to music. So throughout the years, as my production, I started to hire Kenny a lot. So I produced uh, Leslie West, and we worked with Joe Bonamassa with oh Slash. Oh, my gosh, with yeah. People. And it was always us, you know, him and I playing. So this time I say, hey, listen, I just got this thing with Billy. Uh, he just gave me a crazy idea. Maybe this is what we were looking for. I just, I'm going to send you something. So I send him this mp3 within 10 minutes he calls us back because we i was still talking with the little studio he says hey how long are you guys going to be there for i don't know we're about to leave what but is somebody there after you guys not no i'm closing and we're leaving it was my studio this is like don't i'm coming there he just got there with his tech set up the drums we ended up in recording the whole night and that was the first song that we recorded for that record you know oh. it's called running whiskey and right after that i guess uh the rumors spread around. Billy ended up in talking to some other people. And in, right in those days, I was uh, producing a record with Warren Haynes from Almond Brothers and uh, Government Mule. And he came to town two weeks after this recording with Government Mule. They were playing in downtown yeah, Los Angeles. I've seen Government Mule. I went to see him uh, and I was on the tour bus. As soon as I got into the tour bus, he's like, hey, man, so, so what are, <laughs> when, when we're recording, for sure, what do you mean? We just finished recording. But you, I just sent you the last mix last week. Uh, no, no, no. That stuff that Gibbons was telling me. But you, what stuff? What Gibbons? What are you talking about? So um, he said, no, Billy told me something and he played me that you did. You know, I want just what is it? Send me some stuff. Do you have some idea? So I explained him how the thing was developing. We started to exchange things. And 
Two weeks later, he was in a, a studio in upstate New York that I often work with. But we created like a video connection, just much yep. like this one. And I was in my studio in Los Angeles and uh, pretty much recorded one song at distance, you know, kept on the whole session for like six hours. And after that, we ended up in having the second song for the record. It's called Remedy, which actually uh, features Warren Haynes uh, on lead guitar and vocals. And I ended up in mixing these two songs. I sent it to the president of Mascot Records, for whom I already produced several records. And I thought, hey, listen, this is what's going on. Uh, blah, 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 blah. And they offered us a deal immediately. And, you know, and we are. And we here are. we are. So we got a good video. We have right now. Right now. Roll oh, actually, it. Sir, before you start it, this is yes. actually our new singer, guitar player. Uh -huh. This is the first song that we were, studio version, the studio song that we recorded with Chris Barris. Okay. Uh, and uh, it's a little bit of a departure from the old days, because this is more like the new Super Sunny Blues Machine sound. Okay. So I hope you guys like it. We will. Think we Thank will. you all.
And we are back. I am Silver Shells. I'm Cindy Jenkins. We are the, the Bling, Bling Sisters. Sisters. And you're watching our show, Silver Shells Bling Party. We've interviewed 93 people. This is our 93rd, uh, Fabrizio Grossi. And we've just got finished watching uh, Supersonic Blues Machine right now. So welcome back. How are you doing? Do you want to say hi to anybody? Mm, no, I have to everybody. Okay. Thank you for tuning in. Heike Latti. Heike. Heike is Heike, our friend from Dredd Terry, Cafe. John Davidson. So we've got, we got some good people watching. All right. So now with COVID and everything, uh, what are you doing now? <laughs> uh, the word. Yeah, I can't. I mean, it, 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 it does affect everybody and it affects every yeah. well, inch of um, us. It's, it's really bad. I mean, we had a, a long theater tour for this year. We have several different uh, festival days throughout the summer. And right about this time, we should have been in China performing 10 shows with the Shanghai Symphonic Orchestra. Brand new arrangements of all our material. Uh, unfortunately, you know, that didn't happen. I'm glad that I'm here talking to you. Yeah, but, you know, we're glad unfortunately, you are too. It's, uh, you know, that was something that we worked on it for a while. So basically what's going on right now uh, is that uh, with our agents, we're trying to rebook everything for next year and for the following one. Uh, we finished our new studio record, but I don't think it's, I think it's going to be released by the end of May of next year. So we're in the midst of... Uh, addressing, discussing, and fighting with a record company about the the campaign or the spread out and stuff. But no, it, I'm just joking because this time we're we're seeing eye to eye. So it's it, it just takes a little bit of time. We have a new management and okay. hopefully we're going to be able to do more stuff domestically because uh, we're somehow of a super band in Europe and around the world. And in the States, we didn't really play that many shows. I mean, the, the, one that we, the ones that we did were great, but uh, I wish we could have done, you know, as much as we did in Europe or as much as we did around the world. Um, so that's what's going on with Supersonic. Uh, and as far as uh, Soul Garage, obviously, I just released the uh, first single, the one that you guys played before. Yeah. I'm going to have another song coming out right before Christmas. And then again, the full record is coming out in, in uh, January. And um, let's see what happens in terms of uh, live engagements and stuff like that. Because actually, this year, together with all the work of Supersonic, I already had a couple of other months uh, of shows uh, prepared with uh, Soul Garage Experience, even though we didn't have anything released. But, you know, I guess uh, I'm a good agent in the UK and uh, he believes a lot in what we do. And so he was able to get us a bunch of stuff. So just trying to get everything we addressed yeah. and see what's going on, you know. Studio work, unfortunately, I uh, it's a blessing in this guy sometimes, or sometimes it's a curse uh, that I work with a lot of uh, international artists. Uh, it depends. I'm not to say everybody in the has to be a big star, but that, that means a lot of flying, a lot of traveling. And we had that three great big records that we were going to be doing this year that we cannot because obviously there was a lot of people come flying in uh, from Europe, from Eastern Europe and some other in Australia. So it's just already it's just a major mess. So we're just trying to make the, the best out of the worst, I guess. Could, could you jam all together over Zoom? No, because of the delay. Ah, you can. yeah. So you'd have to send a track. We have friends. They record a track, send the track to their friend. They lay it down, and it uh -huh. goes around, and then they come with the finished product. There's no such thing. I mean, I've been looking into uh, to be able to do something like that live, but at the moment, not even at a government level. Actually, probably they got it even worse than us at this point. <laughs> uh, let's not get there. No. Um, all the you know communications, like video communication uh, platforms, even the professional ones, are they always have a latency that it's it's have, hasn't been dealt Fixed. with? Properly. There's always a lag. It's like the ohm, you know. Mm -hmm. So, well, what time is it? How are we doing? It is six fifty. A six little bit 50. past our time. Okay, we're and I up. think we're gonna have to sign off. We are, but we to... have another lovely. A uh, song by the Supersonic Blues Machine featuring Be Warren Haynes. Remedy. 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 Why don't you tell us a little bit about that before we go? Well, that's actually was the song that I was talking about it earlier when I said uh, Warren, uh, uh, you know, 
and I started talking when we were on the tour bus. And this actually is the second single okay. out of our first record. And it's a very particular song. Again, really love the lyric content. It's a song about... Uh, um, uh, Pretty much, you know, just try to, you know, just try to kind of like walk a mile in other people's shoes yeah. too before you make a comment and uh, just rely on the things that are good for everybody to kind of like uh, and to create bridges among, in this case, music in that sense. Just let music do the talking. I mean, at least through that, we can somehow in, uh, interconnect and uh, exchange properly without killing each other. That sounds good. Right well. On. All right, well, so we're night. going to wrap up. We're going to say good night to our loyal followers. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Fabrizio, for being so willing to join us. Have, well, thank you guys for having me, and thanks, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving, and Absolutely. remember to sign up to be an organ donor. That's for Walter. I love you guys. Okay. All right. All right. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs> It's what I feel was safe or so.